coming. Yeah, my name is Skip Mission. I'm just the technical guy doing the slides here today. But um, we got Jerry Perkins. Jerry and I are from Granby. Uh, Jerry's taught at the college level, university level, Westfield State. They changed the name from college. Uh, oh, we get some more prestige. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry's expertise in teaching uh, in public school, college level has always been history. And so he's my, my tutor for my history lessons. We get together every week. A um, couple things before we get started is if you have topics in the future that you would like to see, there's, um, there's a clipboard here if you want to. The other thing we'll do is that, say after 45 minutes, we will just stop for a minute, stretch our legs. If you need to use facilities or anything like that, we'll just a, a couple minute break there. So we'll probably go an hour, hour uh, maybe more like an hour, 15 minutes. Um, question is, OK, let's see. Harry Truman, that's what you're all here for, right? <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> How many were born, uh, were, were born before 1945? <laughs> Just about the whole class. I'm, I'm a baby. I'm only 66 years old. I was born in 56. So. Uh, how many of you remember the A bomb being dropped? The A bomb being dropped. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, right. So it, it's. The, the beauty of this, when Jerry and I were talking, is like, this was in our lifetime. And it's a president, and, and as I've learned, the, the magnitude of where he went from just uh, the Missouri beginnings to a global stage, such a short period of time, now considered probably one of the top five presidents of all time. Yeah, they rated him uh, fourth or fifth now. Out of the 43? As we go through this, the, the amount of things that he did, it, it is amazing. And he was a common man's president. So, with that, we will get started. Um, should I say you want to. President? Or, well, yeah. yeah okay. um, Could you tell us a little bit? Did, about did we have the quotes first, or we were going to. Oh, you want to do the. Okay. Or you can have the quotes right, after? If you can't take the heat, can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. My father used to say that to me all the time. Okay. The buck stops here. Everybody, okay, everybody knows that one. Do you remember when he made the statement, I gave, I never gave anybody hell, I just told the truth and they thought it was hell. <laughs> That was when he was running for re-election. That was when he was running for re-election, that, that uh, off the back of the, the train, okay? And actually my favorite here is, I would rather have peace in the world than be president. It tells you a little bit about the man as he, as he makes statements like that. I like the first one, because you won't hear that much anymore uh, by any major president. Uh, it's an interesting attitude of what, he, of what kind of man he was. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. I haven't heard that lately. <laughs> okay, to get started, you want to tell us a little bit about your family life in general? Yeah, family life. Um, it was in Missouri, a rural area. My father was uh, involved in livestock trading and in, in farming. Hard worker, honest man. Uh, my mother actually uh, graduated from college. Uh, I had a brother and a sister. Uh, I got into farm work uh, when I was young. Uh, I wasn't particularly a, a great childhood. Uh, I was kind of smallish, and uh, my eyesight started to go when I was six or seven. And uh, so I started to wear glasses. And back then, they were rather thick. And if you started wearing glasses, I imagine some of you can remember, I used to be called and ridiculed called uh, four eyes on a regular basis and picked on. And I wasn't big enough to play sports. So I wandered off pretty much uh, by myself. And I read. I read books. Uh, I was an avid reader, was an avid reader, been an avid reader all my life, uh, two or three books a week. 
and probably said I read more than probably anybody else but Teddy Roosevelt uh, himself. And a lot of my stuff was in historical biographies and history. Uh, I mixed it up a little bit, even including some aspects of Shakespeare and some other Greek writers. But uh, self-taught, self-learning. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but I was the only and the last president not to have a, a college degree. Uh, I, uh, when I was old enough to get into college, and I had good grades. I was a very, very good student. But uh, family finances and fortunes just weren't enough uh, for me to afford to go to college. So I stayed on the farm working and doing uh, odd jobs. I also tried uh, looking at the military academy, but uh, I was disallowed and not allowed in because of, of my weak eyesight. So there I was left uh, on the farm, part-time jobs. It was the love of my life. I, it's hard to, if you read enough stuff in the background about me and Bess Truman, uh, how close we were to the day we died. And uh, it was an ongoing love affair. And I think for presidential wife relationships, and there's been a, f a few good ones, and of course we all know all the bad ones, but it was a lifetime love and I depended on her a great deal. It's not that known that she was a very important confidant for me in daily decisions throughout my administration. Quiet in the back of the scenes, uh, I'll say it this way, she was no Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, that was a tough act to follow. And uh, Bess did not like to be in the limelight or giving press conferences. I mean, now and then she, uh, she might be forced to want to do that. But uh, just a marvelous partner. She didn't like Washington that much. She often went back to Missouri to Independence. Uh, I did not like that at all. But uh, she just was tired of the Washington life where, you know, I had to stay. And I'd rather have her around more often than, than not. Here's a, a letter I wrote to her when I was in my 20s. And Bess was always on a pedestal when they first met. And he wasn't too sure that she would ever agree to marry or go out with him. Dear Bessie, you know that you turned me down so easy that I'm almost happy anyway. I never was fool enough to think that a girl like you could ever care for a fellow like me. But I couldn't help telling you how I felt, and I always wanted you to have some fine, rich-looking man. But I know if I ever got the chance, I'd tell you that how I felt, even if I didn't even get to say another word to you. Uh, that was the, you know, you get his attitude and his, and his feeling with her. Uh, she turned him down at that letter in a rejection, and it took another couple years he pursued it, and he said in the letter that he was going to pursue her until she said yes. And it didn't take the, uh, until she, he came back from the United States service in World War I uh, that she did agree uh, to marry him. By the way, she was called often the boss. That was the nickname, the boss in the regular. This is a fine picture of our only child, Margaret who uh, ended up being a classical singer and piano player, and was uh, piano playing and working in a uh, uh, concert hall, Metropolitan Hall in uh, New York City. And there's a kind of a famous episode that occurred. I have to preface uh, some of my remarks here because um, I've often been known as having a rash and rather vulgar kind of language now and then. And I was uh, sort of uh, reprimanded by members of my staff to keep it down. Although I think it was a joke I, one time when Nixon told me, you know, you got to watch your language in the public. <laughs> I don't know if you ever read some of his tapes, but <laughs> I could never compete with that. Uh, I will say I never used the F word. Uh, it was always goddamn son of a bitch or bastard or something in, so, something in that nature. Anyways, in regards to Margaret, my beloved, uh, singing a concert, a critic, a music critic, got right in the Washington Post criticized her, said she was flat, unprofessional, couldn't sing, would never get anywhere. Well, that really peeved me off, I tell you that. And at the time as president, I sat down and I wrote out a letter, you know, saying, you know, you're a guy, you know, who's got eight ulcers, but you only get paid for four. And uh, that was one of the worst reviews. I don't understand how a guy like you got a job like that. And he said, you know, if I ever happen to meet you, you better be prepared, because you're gonna need a new nose and you better get some beef steaks for your eyes, and you might need a supporter below. <laughs> and I sent that off. 
Uh, Surprisingly, uh, I didn't get much of a bad review on that, and uh, they let it go. Maybe it was out of a devotion of fatherly love. <laughs> I'm not sure. She went on to get married, and I had a couple of grandkids. Now, uh, Mr. President, before politics, there was World War I. Yes. Fine young man in that uniform. <laughs> love it, those hats. Still had my glasses. But you know, believe it or not, I worked hard, I was a devoted soldier, and I got promoted to be a captain wow. in the United States military. Yeah, no college or background. And I got a lot of accolades. I was a captain of an artillery unit in the northern France on the, on, in the trenches. And uh, my men gave me uh, grave reviews. I remember a couple times there were, you know, what does happen in war, they started to get out of the trenches and started running back, and I chased after you, son of a bitch, you get back into that trench, I'll kick your ass out. <laughs> well, in that way, he did go back to the trench. And the other people saw me, how I stood up for myself and my leadership, and uh, so I got a lot of good accolades and a couple of medals of honor for, uh, for my participation in World War I. Um, in some ways, it was kind of relief, because I got off the farm, too. <laughs> Coming back, I don't know what the next one is. No, we were jumping a little ahead of time. So uh, coming back, I opened up my brother, got out of the uh, farm business and opened up a haberdashery. I don't know if anybody remembers that from him, uh, a clothing hat store. And uh, it failed. It went bankrupt. And uh, geez, I was looking around for what to do. Here I was, and I just got married. And uh, uh, I knew a family called the Pendergrasses. It's a powerful political family in Missouri. Uh, it was a big political machine in the days when there were political machines. He liked me because his son was also uh, in the militia and knew me through the military. So if you got the approval of Pendergast and his machine, you pretty much had a chance to get elected. And I ran for an administrative judge, it was called. You didn't have to have a law degree. Of course, you didn't have to have a law degree then either. You, know. you studied on your own. You took the law test and passed it. That's what Abraham Lincoln did. Uh, he was smart enough on his own. He just studied it uh, by himself with no formal training. So anyways, I, got a, I did get elected as administrator, and I, I ran for a couple terms uh, as administrative judge. And uh, people liked me. Pendergast liked me and supported me for the Senate. And in 19, it was 1938, I ran for the Senate of uh, Missouri, and I won. And that'll be the first of two terms. Now, this picture here is on Time Magazine. I got on Time once. Even though I was a rather obscure senator overall uh, in the United States Senate, I, m I was made head of an investigating committee to research fraud and corruption in the military and, and big government and contracts. And, you know, it still goes on. Uh, where's all that military money going, you know? Its budget today is about $800 billion. Uh, a lot of it just falls off the table and they can't figure out where, they, where it ends. <laughs> it's, the only, uh, it's the only major department, I don't know if you ever heard, that doesn't get audited. You got to check that out. Anyways, I saved, uh, according to different re reports, and I was on that committee for several years uh, during uh, the beginning of World War II, and I saved, at the time they said, $15 billion, which amounts today to about $200, $300 billion in money in government contracts. So... Uh, I got some notoriety for that. How many years were you in the... Uh, ten years uh, before uh, FDR decided to appoint me as the vice president. This was in his uh, third term, fourth term, fourth term. Uh, he didn't, didn't like the last guy he had. He usually got rid of his vice presidents. And they looked at me and I said, me? What, I mean, you know, little old me in uh, Missouri, small senator. No big shot, nothing you know, big in the news. But that was good. Roosevelt liked that. He didn't want any competition. He wanted a guy to sit in the corner and keep his mouth shut. And uh, that's why I got chosen. <laughs> so. You were also a supporter of the... the yeah, I, I, yeah, I was a supporter of the New Deal. Yeah, I was a big supporter of New Deal and his programs when he was president. And um, the other one is... Uh, the inauguration, isn't it? Yeah. Next one is. Yeah. yeah. All right. This is uh, the inauguration of. I had to be sworn in as president of the United States. What a day that was! Uh, I have no expectation of it. Although, I don't know why. When you look back and I think of it, think of it. Roosevelt was very, very sick. 
A lot of people knew that he should not have run the fourth term. And he only lasted four or five weeks. Uh, Eleanor and all the others and, his, and people close to him said, don't run. Uh, if you looked at some old pictures, I was going to dig up, but I, I haven't. He was very gaunt. He lost a lot of weight. He had already had two or three strokes that was unbeknown by the press and not put out uh, about how sick he was. We're talking about temperature in some ways, blood pressures well over 200 that were registered at different times. And uh, one or two times he couldn't get out of bed. And yet, you know, they rolled him out enough to go to a couple of uh, rallies for his uh, election back in the 1943, and, and uh, he won the election. He wanted to see the end of the, uh, World War II. Unfortunately, he died about three or four weeks before the actual ending in uh, April, because the ending of World War II, you know, ended in May. Well, I got to tell you, I felt like the, the planets and the world and everything had fell on me that day. I was, just, I was just in shock the day that I walked in here that I was now going to take the place of FDR. FDR! <laughs> what? Talk about an act to follow. Uh, here I am, this unassuming guy, not, a, you know, not particularly a big deal in politics. But you know, one of my strongest beliefs is I'm not going to be an FDR. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, particularly anybody famous or, or, or great in notoriety. I didn't, I didn't go to Harvard or Yale. But I always had enough self-confidence. And the thing I believed in is that you just do the best you can. You pay attention, you focus, and that will get you by, more or less. And that's where my heart was in terms of what I was going to do. I believed in the country, and most of all, I believed in the common man. Uh, just to speak outside the talk, Harry Truman to me, and is one of the most, or the likable uh, presidents that I've ever studied, I pretty much studied all of them. But it was his plain spoken, uh, just down to the earth type of personality. Nothing extravagant, no big speeches, no yelling rallies. He got up, he spoke exactly, it was clear, he had a strong voice, and he always spoke in favor of the common man. He often would rail against big business and uh, corruption and against Wall Street. Uh, if you heard him talk, you might have think he was more like Bernie Sanders today. Uh, that they were stealing the money and the ordinary man is not going to get anywhere and I'm going to fight there for the ordinary man who, who was struggling, the farmer and those kind of man, uh, men in my administration of what you know FDR did with the New Deal and he was going to continue that New Deal and when he got to president he called it the Fair Deal which was a continuation of uh, many uh, New Deal products. Actually when I first walked in to get, to get the sworn in ceremony uh, Eleanor came up and uh, I said to Eleanor, you know, you have my condolences, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you. Eleanor actually responded to me, oh no, Harry, it's we that need to help you. <laughs> You're the one in trouble now. Uh, she was brilliant. Uh, later, uh, I will appoint her as the ambassador, the first ambassador to the UN. Uh, when she was there and uh, did a marvelous job. And I announced, when I announced that she was ambassador to the UN, I said, now we have the first lady of the world, Eleanor Roosevelt. I like to take walks. Uh, John always had that well-dressed look, his hat and a cane, and he used to walk around uh, the White House. Uh, there was one mention that he did 120 steps a minute. And uh, there were other reporters in the Secret Service there following who could not keep up <laughs> at different times with them. Slow down, slow down so we could talk to you uh, and move around. Uh, then he was done. He had breakfast. And he had a strange habit, but he always had one shot of bourbon for breakfast. Uh, just one. Uh, unlike uh, Churchill, by the way, who probably in a day would have 10 or 12 drinks. I remember... Uh, I remember when Churchill was coming to visit FDR, Eleanor would say to me, I hope the hell he doesn't stay too long, he'll kill Franklin. <laughs> he wouldn't go to bed till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, 10, 12 drinks later. Now, at this point, you're in office. Right. You immediately jump into the whole European theater. Yeah, we're, uh, we're at the end of the war. This is an iconic picture. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. I don't know if you need, can you tell who that is? Anybody want to yell it out? Or? Well, the American soldiers 
Let's see, that's your uh, right. And the Russians on the left, this is at the Elbe River, which crosses the central part of Germany. And they shook hands. This would be the last most friendly group of Russian American connections probably ever again, especially <laughs> if you think about it now. That signified the end of the war. You know, the Russians made an incredible uh, contribution to, you know, finally destroying Nazi Germany. And, you know, Stalin was the, the leader of, uh, of Russia at the time. The Russian contribution was incredibly much larger than anyone else. Uh, and Stalin would use that. Just to give you some idea of a figure, there were like 25 million Russians died in World War II. Uh, and no, uh, you know, no loss of life is insignificant. But the American loss was somewhere around 400,000. If you want to make a comparison to uh, the contributions uh, that uh, the Russians made. And this is why uh, dealing with the Russians in negotiations after World War II was so difficult. Because Stalin said, you know, I really paid the price for this. You know, you guys came in as a latecomers, you know, you Churchill, I saved Churchill's ass, you know, <laughs> and all the other stuff, which made him a tough guy to handle. But uh, Stalin was a ruthless, horrible, uh, uh, heartless dictator. There's estimates that, you know, even though 25 million uh, Russians died fighting, he probably killed over 20 million himself of his own people just to stay in power. And a lot of them were Ukrainians. When they went through the, the Ukraine area and when the Nazis went through there and destroying the grain fields and the other things that uh, during the war at the time. Um, we helped Stalin, by the way, uh, in Lend-Lease program, a little known fact, we had paid money and were sending uh, munitions, tanks even, so forth, on ships around to the outside to help the Russian in, the, in, the, in fighting in World War II. They never pretty much gave, it, gave us credit for that particular uh, support and aid during that period of time. So we went from the big three, uh, which uh, Roosevelt was involved in, and there they're all sitting together. I think Truman looks the, the, the healthiest and the most upright and ready to go. Churchill's ready to, you know, kind of sack out. He'll lose the election, by the way. I don't know if he lost the election right after World War II. Uh, they threw him out of office. But the old boy ran again four years later, and he won. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is the bargain of, uh, this is at Potsdam in Germany. And here, uh, Truman was going to take a measure of uh, Stalin. He says he's a congenial fellow, but of course I, he's a lying, rotten snake generally underneath. And, I, and he said, I know that. And you can't trust him. One of the big issues that was going on at the time that they wanted to talk about was that uh, Stalin had promised on a number of occasions free elections in East Germany. Now I'll get a, a map up here. Um, I think we have the, uh, I want the, Euro no, I don't know, not the, not the European map, but anyway. All right, we can say uh, all of these, all of the East uh, Europe, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, were taken over by the Russians as they moved and drove the Nazis back, right? And that, you know, from World War II. Well, he promised free elections, but he never, the Russian army, the communists never left those countries. They stayed and were controlled by the communists all the way up to 1990. Uh, Stalin lied continually that they were going to offer free elections, particularly to the Polish. It was a, a very heart-rendering thing because uh, the Russians at, uh, at one time killed about 20,000 Polish soldiers in the woods outside of uh, Poland uh, in a war. You know, previous, Stalin and Hitler signed a treaty before the war started, World War II as an agreement not to attack each other and divide up parts of the eastern part of Europe. These, little, these two snakes <laughs> in the same pit. And uh, when uh, Hitler decided to attack Russia, Stalin at the time was absolutely shocked. What? How could he? We signed a treaty. And I, you know, I'm thinking, how can you imagine you could trust these, these guys, each other? I mean, it's like two mafia figures, you know, going in there, each one wanting to assassinate the other. Uh, Stalin was in such shock that he actually went in hiding for over a week, and the Nazis kept growing. You know, uh, they could have actually beat the Russians. They came within 15 miles of Moscow. 15! Before uh, Stalin got his stuff together, brought some troops over from the Urals and so forth and made a counterattack. That saved Russia. Uh, and then in the other major battle, you might read, it's a whole book on Leningrad, 
was one of the most vicious fighting areas and cities in, in all of world history. Uh, the Nazis and uh, the Russians fought hand-to-hand -hand combat in that city. Uh, grenades, snipers, machine guns in the city streets. 300,000 deaths in that one particular battle. And uh, Hitler's main general corps told him on a numerous retreat, God damn it, you know, we're going to lose everything. Not Hitler. Hitler thought he was a military genius back then and he would never allow anyone to retreat. Uh, Stalin and Hitler had the same views on that. Uh, they often set up cords, uh, you might know, in the back of the front lines uh, that were just set up for anybody trying to retreat or leave the fighting that they would be shot by their own military <laughs> for retreating during battle. Okay, uh, Potsdam. Uh, this, the number, I'm going to come back to this. Um, okay. right, we'll, go, we'll go to that map now. Okay. Uh, this is an agreement, a very, really unusual, complex agreement made uh, during their conferences about what to do with Germany. Uh, Stalin was particularly harsh on Germany. He wanted to turn it into a, virtually a vegetable garden and leave it that way forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was very he, he, uh, angry about Germany. Germany, you know, started the la more or less. I mean, started the last two wars, and both times the Russians were involved. So he wanted protection against the Germans. He wanted a buffer state. And he wanted to reduce Germany so they would never, never have an industrial uh, power or a military again. That was the bargaining power. Churchill and at this time um, Truman fought against that whole idea of reducing him down. They said, well, a little bit, but not, not as far as you want to go. Uh, we want to help rebuild Germany and make, you know, make them a modern state. Uh, we need a modern state in, in Europe at the time. So anyway, this is what they came up with. They divided Germany, uh, this lasted about eight, nine years, between the uh, Allies on British, if you can see that, the uh, French and the US zones, that was in the uh, West. And East Germany was divided up and aligns with the, uh, uh, the Soviet or Russian zone, East Germany. Now, a peculiar situation, as you can see, and that's why I like this map anyways, is the city of Berlin, which was the capital of Germany. Divided the, they divided the city of Berlin in the same kind of sections. Did you see that? In the center of the eastern part of communist Germany. So a provision was made in the treaty and agreement that they had three access ways that would go from the western zone into Berlin so that we could trade and West Berliners could come back and go to work or go back and forth or uh, you know, bring in goods and services that they needed into the main city from uh, West Germany. That's the way it was held. We'll go off and uh, I'm going to hold that, come back to it at, uh, a little later. Now we gotta... We're going to finish. We're going to jump to the Pacific uh, War. Best buddy. <laughs> You're jumping ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, America was really the only major power to really be an influence on both uh, the theaters, the European and the Pacific. I mean, there was some help, obviously, that in, the, in the European theater, uh, especially the English that we fought with in Africa and then later in Europe and you know, the Normandy landing, which we participated in. But in the Pacific, uh, you know, we're pretty much on our own. The, uh, the British had got their ass kicked uh, in several colonies and uh, it was left to us after Pearl Harbor. Uh, some people said historically that you know the Japanese made a mistake. They stopped at Pearl Harbor. They should have kept going. <laughs> they really, they really brought this up and hit the West Coast, and that might have scared us off, and signed a treaty. Because uh, Yamamoto, I don't know if you know him. He was the the major commander of the naval forces of Japan. He was against attacking Pearl Harbor. Don't touch it. You're going to wake, he said, in the terms a sleeping giant. Eh, don't worry about him. <laughs> but Yamanova was, was quite prophetic. Because uh, after Pearl Harbor, we, who knows how long we would have gotten into World War II, which was a very, very uh, you know, tenuous situation. Uh, you know, Churchill was begging us you know, to get started. The American public, 60, 75% of the different polls did not want to fight in the European war or going to war at all. And if it wasn't for your, uh, the, the communication between Churchill in Roosevelt, uh, we would have made, waited longer and longer. And who knows what that might have ended up to be. But uh, the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor, finally we declared war against Japan. We did not declare war against Germany. 
one of Hitler's biggest mistakes was four days later, he declared war on us. And in history, they said, that was the second dumbest mistake that Hitler did. <laughs> For now, the Congress and the United States public was all on board to fight the Germans and which part of the war we were going to fight first. We set up we were going to fight a German, Germany first, but uh, actually we ended up uh, moving off to the Pacific on midway and important battles there. Uh, our industrial production in World War II was just uh, way off the charts. Uh, after uh, Pearl Harbor, it only took less than a month to rebuild the fleet, put it together, and be strong enough to attack the, uh, the Japanese Navy. And within months of, the, of that attack, we had a major win in Midway Island, and uh, we were off. I mean, it's going to take another three years to finish it. But uh, we were on the offensive, and the Japanese now had to keep moving back uh, on the so-called, I don't know if you ever heard, the island hop, hop theory which was uh, formulated, developed by uh, Douglas MacArthur in that war. Uh, so he was in charge of the Pacific military, and then we had Admiral Nimitz and Halsey in charge of the naval forces in uh, the Pacific. And you remember, the, it's mostly a naval war, naval battles, but they had to take each of those islands, like uh, Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal, and they lost thousands of guys, because the Japanese were just unconquerable. Uh, They'd rather commit suicide than surrender. Harry Carey and their whole lot of bonsai, their dying efforts for the emperor, uh, they thought it was horribly dishonorable to actually die in battle and give up and surrender. They'd rather kill themselves. And that's why in many cases, they, uh, it was pointed out, they treated American soldiers and prisoners so bad because they thought, you surrendered, you are all cowards, you deserve to die. So on the death march and others, they beat the hell and starved the Americans. I mean, it was a, the, the treatment was atrocious. And you could probably read a lot of them, uh, particularly in the Philippines, on the death march, it was called. You know, 75% of them got starved, beaten, or shot uh, in those camps, you know, uh, that the Japanese controlled. And uh, I'm surprised that, you know, we weren't uh, more vicious at the end of the war in regard to the leaders and what, we, and what they did to us. General Douglas MacArthur, what a hero, heroic. He was an icon. He was the man, the most popular man in America for about 20 years, starting World War I. Uh, always had that flat cap, sunglasses, and often uh, a pipe, and the same outfit he would parade in. Uh, I studied and found out he had his own press corps, kept them with him, so that in certain high moments, yeah, take me now. Picture like this. Oh, wait a minute. I want to I get the left side. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower worked under him as, 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 a, as a major general and assistant, and uh, Doug, Eisenhower hated him. Arrogant, egotistical son of a bitch. Everything is about what he wants and what he thinks. Uh, MacArthur was once asked about, how, what kind of a general do you think Eisenhower was? Oh, you mean that clerk? <laughs> This is the iconic picture of I shall return to the Philippines because during the battle the Japanese were taking over the islands and it was told for MacArthur to get the hell out of there. We didn't want him captured so he went off to Australia. Uh, There's a lot of different stories but anyways, uh, he came back as the leader and uh, we're getting near the end of uh, World War II because we dropped the big one. And it was my decision to drop it. And even though there's some criticisms and the rest of it, I can tell you what the military people and my uh, chiefs of staff told me, and Joint Chiefs, in order to take the island of Japan, in order to invade the island, in order to get the Japanese surrender, it would probably cost up to a million more men of deaths to take that island. Uh, you may not look that big on the map, but you know, uh, Japan's about the size of California. And if they fought with the same determination they did on each of those islands, uh, you know, suicidal, I'll die, you know, under e each cost, uh, it would have taken that or the, at least a half a million. Let alone, which a figure we often uh, fail to recognize, is how many native uh, peoples would have died. And it would have cost, the, you know, the Japanese one or two million more people to invade that island. So as I said in a speech, I found the bomb and I used it. They didn't surrender. We don't have the other one, but uh, Nagasaki and four days later, they finally gave up. Uh, why it took so long, I have no idea. 
Uh, so I just took one picture. I wasn't going, going to a lot about the war, but you know, you've seen the, the devastation there in, in Nagasaki uh, after the war where the em emperor finally agreed. Interesting story about the emperor. The emperor is regarded as a demigod in Japan. He's above an ordinary person. He's not a, uh, a real person. He lives in a castle in the clouds. Uh, he rarely talks to the people. He doesn't even go on a radio broadcast. Uh, he doesn't walk around. Uh, you're virtually not allowed to see him. It's a great idea. It's like the, you know, it's like the Wizard of Oz. You know, he's behind the curtain. He's there. He must be. Oh, he's magnificent. He's wonderful. And they pray to him virtually uh, as a god in their lifetime. So uh, he finally spoke after the second bomb was dropped and said, you know, we are, we are going to surrender. I want to end the war. And a lot of members of the Japanese uh, military who were running the country, actually, it was run by a small military corps. The name of the guy was named Tojo. You might have heard of him. He was put on a military trial and ex executed. But he actually ran the country. He would pass ideas off to the emperor, but the emperor just go yes, no, or maybe, but he never really got that involved. So anyway, we finally get a surrender uh, in, this, uh, in this horrible war. And uh, there was a... And now we shift back to the European theater. What's going on? Yes. While all that's going on in the Pacific. Yeah, we, we end that. Uh, I'm in charge, the president. I see that there, you can see the map, there is a communist influence spreading throughout the different parts of Europe and the eastern part of Europe. And uh, this is uh, a policy that I developed called the containment policy, or the Truman Doctrine, to contain communism. And this is NATO, which is in the news all the, today. And it came under my regime, and I began NATO, which was an agreement of all those countries you see in blue to defend against any attacks uh, against any European country by the communists and the Russians. It's a way to halt quote, the expansion of communism. Uh, it's hard to imagine after the war and after the Russians had conquered the country, refused uh, you know, special elections. And the Russians themselves dropped the bomb. And now they have atomic weapons. Uh, I do have to tell you a little story. When I was vice president and we were developing the Manhattan Project, I was never informed. I was left out of the loop. Roosevelt would call me in for lunch once a month, talk about diddly, but nothing, you know, very substantial. I didn't know he had the bomb until the day I got, uh, you know, sworn in as president. You know who knew ahead of me? Stalin. <laughs> because there was such a large number of spies in the Manhattan Project and in the State Department that he had gotten word and... Uh, I once told Stalin at Potsdam, we got a very big weapon here, you better be kind of careful. And he just went, <laughs> because he already knew. And then he developed his own atomic bomb in 1949, I think, uh, so it made him, it made him an atomic power. Uh, also, one of the biggest contributions that we had made to Europe to help them out uh, after the war was the Marshall Plan. Uh, General Marshall is one of the great military leaders of the United States, highly respected. Next to Eisenhower, Eisenhower and Marshall were, were close friends. Uh, he was kind of a silent guy, but he was regarded as the brain trust of the military for advice for all, several presidents. And he wanted to develop us a $13 billion. Well, in today's money, you can imagine it's over a half a probably trillion <laughs> uh, in today's figures that we passed out in monies to help the, the Europeans. Uh, and that's also a good map to show you where the uh, Warsaw, the yellow, the pink countries under the Russian agreement, they put those countries under their control. Yugoslavia remains neutral, which is an interesting thing. I don't know. I had a speaker from Yugoslavia a couple weeks ago, uh, a man named Tito. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was the dictator of Yugoslavia for years. But he was a communist, and he was an independent communist, if you want to call it that. <laughs> He refused to uh, join Stalin's Warsaw Pact group. And I was gave him a lot of credit because it took a lot of guts to say no to Stalin. Uh, but they became independent for a long years. Later it broke up in the Bosnia War, but that's another story. Greece was saved by Truman. By, we sent in uh, millions and millions of dollars of equipment, uh, supported their men and the military, part of the Greek army because the, the communists were starting to inf infiltrate there to take over Greece and put it under communist control. 
uh, to this day. I mean, uh, of course, it remains a democratic uh, country uh, from which we saved them. And look what's happened, you know, years later. Uh, Germany, of course, you can imagine how devastated Germany was. The fire bombings. I don't know if you've seen some of the pictures. Dresden had over 100,000 people burnt to death and alive by some of the fire bombs. And, and the major Berlin and all the major cities of Germany. And they're a fantastic industrial country before the war. Some of the most industrial uh, people in the world, Germans. And where are they today? You know, probably the third or fourth uh, largest economy in the world. Thanks. In the large part, uh, I don't like to wave the flag too often, but that's a major contribution we made to the world. Uh, and a major uh, turn and a major ally. Uh, there, but... Back in Japan. <laughs> Iconic picture. Guess who's in charge of Japan? <laughs> yeah, Truman put uh, MacArthur. But uh, Truman didn't like him either. He thought he was an ego, he said also an egotistical son of a bitch too. But uh, MacArthur uh, was an uh, administrative genius also. He became the sort of governor general of Japan. And uh, here's a picture of him and Hirohito together, the Japanese emperor. Uh, we decided to save and spare Hirohito's life. Uh, there, was, there was a struggle or debate at the time because he could have been tried on the war crimes. But the uh, people of Japan beloved him so much that we came to the point that, you know, it would be unruly and there'd be fights, maybe civil war, all kinds of problems if we killed Hirohito. Keep him alive. The family is still there in the palace. I mean, they have a democratic system, but they still honor the, uh, uh, them as the emperors uh, in Japan and the family. Uh, Truman did a marvelous job. Uh, he literally put the Japanese together, he said, the major leaders, administrator offices in a room, and said, develop a constitution. And he gave them the American constitution, said, here's a good one, try to copy it. And they sat in there for uh, two weeks, 10 days or so, and they came up with, really, what a lot of people throughout the world believe is a very, very good constitution. And uh, by the way, there's a special section of it dealing with women's rights which uh, for a, particularly for an Asian country was quite outstanding. Uh, and they have a very strong functioning democratic system. Nothing's perfect, of course, <laughs> who is, uh, but a very strong democratic system. And today, one of our, of course, one of our major allies in the uh, Asian area, which uh, we are going to badly need sometime either now or in the future, aren't we, in some cases. So. Let's turn domestic now. Domestic, okay, we get, uh, Harry's gonna run. Run, Harry, run for his own term. And you probably have heard a lot about that election. Uh, the poll numbers were low for uh, Truman. And I kept, why, why were they low? You know, different, different types of reasons. Uh, sometimes he came off too gruff, but I don't think that was the major reason. Uh, well, I'll find out later, he uh, did sign an agreement to allow Israel to become a country. And we do have a strong anti-Semitic uh, strain in this nation. And you probably heard that from a few weeks ago. We had uh, a large number of our attacks, uh, anti-Semitic attacks. Why now or ever? I have no idea what was going on. The economy had different problems. He also, through his program, he had to deal with the Republican Congress. Uh, all the years, it was always Democratic under FDR. And uh, you know the public overall got tired of it. So now they put in Republicans. And that hurt his, uh, somewhat of his image to some degree. Uh, and people didn't give him enough credit for NATO and the other things he did after the war. He simply was a guy who did not get enough credit a lot of times while he was in office. Uh, like I said, he got revered a lot more later. So the polls all had him down. Of course, we don't. The polls end. Look at him now. <laughs> so, and these days, the polls stopped two days before the election. Two days. It was a, and this paper <laughs> was printed the night before uh, that he had it. So you imagine the joy I felt, <laughs> to myself, on the next day to find out that he had actually won. And he found this, he got the paper, put it up there and had printed this up and had pictures taken by the press. Um, one of the reasons that we have to mention is uh, he was an excellent campaigner. Uh, it was called the Whistle Stop Tour. You don't hear about this anymore. On the back of a train, it was a caboose. He'd go through all these little towns. 
he made hundreds and hundreds of stops. And just to see him when he came out to the caboose, you know, and give a little speech, thousands of people showed up. That gave him a lot of confidence that, you know, really he was going to win. And that's where he, uh, he got the thing was, uh, give him hell, Harry. And he said, you know, at the time, uh, no, I'm not really giving him hell. I'm just telling the truth. They think it's hell. And that was his motto as he went through uh, uh, to win the election on his own. Truman uh, did set up as part of his fair deal. Uh, he was involved in the Civil Rights Commission. He was involved in trying to promote, uh, he said, uh, no discrimination in government contracts, for example. And uh, one of the most important uh, statements that he ever made as far as this country goes, he desegregated the military by executive order. 1948 it took. They had fought in separate segregated units all during World War I and World War II. And they were ill-treated when they got home. If you can read a lot of stories and by, of the of even some of the, the military uh, people, black people in uniforms, they were actually beaten or even lynched in this country. It was a horrendous attitude. They didn't respect the fact that the black man was fighting for freedom and whatever we needed in this nation uh, when they got in different areas. And that's not only in the South. That included a lot of discrimination and problems we also had in the North. What I like about this news article is the, uh, you know, the, the small article underneath where uh, what was going on at the same time he printed the idea that he desegregated the military. There was a lynching that day. Uh, this is a good picture I caught of uh, after a group of guys somewhere you know, in the 50s after the uh, desegregation order of black and white soldiers together, integrated. And I think more, all, more uh, of all our institutions that's been recognized, the military has been best uh, for integrating and working with uh, different minorities and integrations. You know, I'll examples like Colin Powell for, uh, in, in that way. And uh, he, he was an excellent example. But there, but there are many others, and they got promoted and they got generalships and leadership positions in the military. Back to Berlin. In 1948, Truman faces another problem. It's called the Berlin uh, uh, Airlift or before that was the blockade. What the Russians tried to do was uh, prevent the access ways from the Allied zones, the West Zone, into Berlin and cut them off so we couldn't uh, give them supplies or set it up or help them out at all in Berlin. That was against the treaty and the agreement. So there was no way to get through there unless we forced ourselves. I'm gonna tell you that this is about as close to World War III that we came to the Russians even including the Cuban Missile Crisis. Here, the next uh, picture is a picture of the uh, loading planes. We got these transport planes, loaded them with food, materials, medicines, etc., flew them over the Russian zone and dropped them by air and left into West Berlin. And that went on for a year, if you can imagine. People read the newspapers. And all I can tell you, if one of those planes was struck or, or brought down, we probably would have had World War III there with the Russians at the time. And maybe uh, General uh, Patton was right when I, right after the war, he said, ah, let's keep going all the way to Moscow. <laughs> we wouldn't have a Cold War. Uh, nobody agreed. But <laughs> probably a good spot for a break. Do you want to get water or something? Stretch. A couple minutes. No, I can go. I can do. I mean, anybody needs to use facilities? Or you've got, all we've got probably 15 minutes to 20 minutes more yet or so. Yeah, a couple more. We've been, jump, we've been taking you around the globe back and forth. We're not done yet. So after Berlin, we got to go back. There's the Korean War we got to talk about. Yeah, let me uh, just state a couple of things uh, at home on a domestic thing called a fair deal. Uh, he was an advocate, as Franklin Roosevelt was, for a national health system. Well, we know where that went. <laughs> you know, that's been a fight. I just wanted to bring it up because that's been going on since Roosevelt, and every Democratic administration has tried to get something like that put in. Uh, no, and he was always in favor of minimum wage. 
And uh, I remember Truman making a uh, comment about it. He says, the Republicans are too, but they want uh, as minimum, a minimum wage as you can get. So, I mean, uh, there was always these quips about the upper class and their power and, and domination of the economic system. Uh, oh, the, the nutrition program. He was the first one to put in the uh, school nutrition food program in the, in the schools on a national basis. To, along with all the other stuff he was doing, <laughs> he was dealing with. Korea, there's a story. Uh, the peninsula of Korea and Japan, they're quite close to it. After the war, uh, the Second World War, and we divided up territories between us and the Russians and the communists. Uh, right now, the communists had won a civil war, you might know of. Uh, the leader of the civil war in China was Mao Tse-Sung, you might have heard of him. He was a vicious uh, communist dictator. And he won the Civil War and kicked out a guy named Chiang Kai-shek, and he kicked him off to an island that we now know as Taiwan. Is that in the news today? Well, that started way back in 1949, and we have made a commitment to support Taiwan if the Chinese ever try to invade it. Whoa! So let's, uh, we'll keep that in mind. But now uh, they'll be under the control of Red China, Chinese government, uh, to this day, of course, one of our most formidable uh, enemies, you might call it. Anyways, North Korea gets divided. We'll see the 38th parallel line, if you can see that little purple line between North and South Korea. Uh, that's the way we divided it. We did the same thing in uh, Vietnam. North and South and the North will uh, be controlled by a communist, a communist government. South, some kind of a democratic situation that they voted on. Well, 1950. Uh, in the year, I think it was April, that the North Koreans decide to invade South Korea on their own, unprovoked invasion, crossing the, uh, the 38th parallel line. Well, everybody strikes out and says, you know, unfair aggression and so forth by the North Koreans, and it gets to the UN. The UN gets involved. This is called the UN War, whether you know it or not. We had about 15 or 16 countries fight uh, with the Americans in South Korea in the Korean War. However, 90% of all the fighting and the deaths were done by the Americans. So I don't, know. Uh, I don't know what the contributions were. I really didn't study them of the other countries, but it wasn't a hell of a lot. As they are pushing forward, the UN takes a motion uh, to uh, protest against the aggression to the North Koreans. And uh, it doesn't work at all, so it goes to the Security Council. Now, I don't know if you know about how the UN is set up, but in the Security Council is made up of seven, eight members, and they have the power to take action. The assembly of general, the group of nations, they can vote protest, but they can't take action. And in the Security Council, which is made up of so-called big four, the United States, England, France, and then uh, Russia was also a member of that. Later, they will rotate some of the others. Now, it only takes one veto vote to stop any action, one veto vote on, on the Security Council. And the day they got, decide to uh, use a military action in South Korea, Russia boycotts the UN <laughs> over some other issue that they had with Red China. They did not attend the meeting and so far and the Security Council passes the resolution to send the military unit of the UN to South uh, Korea. So on that basis, out of a little luck, uh, we get that done. Now Truman is very adamant against the expansion of communism uh, and the idea of it, of it spreading. It's hard to imagine today, or maybe not, but the biggest fear, like when I was growing up, going to school, was the expansion of communism. The Russians had a uh, communist country, huge country, right? Uh, they had already taken over most of the Eastern European countries, all under the Russian control. And then Red China becomes communist. The largest population country in the world, right next to Russia. They got to be allies. It looks to me, and I saw maps of it when I was a kid, you know, big uh, wave of communism sweeping across the world. And really was our biggest concern growing up. I thought uh, if we didn't stop communists where in its tracks where it was, uh, all it was going to do is spread. I think how a lot of other people believe the same thing. In Vietnam, we, uh, we went there because of the spread of communism. And you remember the idea back there was the idea called a domino theory. You know, when one country goes communist, then the next one, and it'll all fall in. Uh, it didn't really happen, but in the 60s, that was the most predominant theory of what was going to happen to the world. So we had to jump in. Uh, nobody wants to go all the way to Korea 
12,000 miles away around the world and get involved in a war. You have to look at the logistics. One of the biggest questions of the military is don't ever, they say, get involved in a land war in Asia. <laughs> well, uh, that was violated on two or three instances. Oh, we'll go back there, one more back. Uh, that little red spot there, uh, that's called the Pusan. It's on the end of, the, of Korea. It's called the Pusan Peninsula. And the North Korean army had pushed South Korea and some remnants of American army all the way down to that end of the, where the ocean is to the very tip of South Korea and were ready to abol you know, abolish the whole country and, uh, and take it over. MacArthur gets the nod to lead the UN troops in Korea and he starts to make a movement and some military in the South Korean uh, border uh, on the ocean side and does some damage pushing back the North Koreans but very slow and uh, not fast at all, deliberate. But what MacArthur does, and this is one of the uh, probably the most predominant uh, actions American general ever took. Oops, this was my uh, <laughs> wire to hook me up to. Here's the Busan Peninsula. MacArthur does a, uh, a movement around the lines. It's called the Inchon uh, on the coast here. You can, it's right up around here behind the enemy lines. It was an incredibly daring, uh, really magnificent, imaginative attack. Virtually uh, none of his, uh, of the Joint Chiefs or his advisors think it's going to succeed. Uh, he, of course, believes it will. I think, uh, oh yes, we got to be in. Time out. Excellent. Does anybody realize just how, how dangerous that thing was? Go ahead. Because there's 32 feet tide difference in the uh, in Inchon. Yeah. Second highest tide difference in the world. So the tide goes out. I mean, it's you know we got water. Yeah. Tide goes out, and it as and then tide comes back in. You only got two hours to make the Inchon. Yeah. Work. Attack. Work. Yeah. Otherwise, every soldier would have been drowned in that. And if I was there, I have not. I'm not there to war. Oh. But I have been there in Incheon. When that tide goes out, and you drop 32 feet. Of tide, wow. It just cleans that whole cargo out. Yeah. Because you know we used to have uh, ships way out in the harbor and waited for the tide to come in. In order to uh, uh, bring it in to uh, ship it on. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we had 1,000 to 6,000 Koreans working for us. Uh, oh, so up there. Off the, uh, off the river. And how MacArthur thought in the world? So he was about the only one, from what I know. He was about the only one yeah. that believed. Uh, well, <laughs> that was an example. Uh, but that only reinforced it because it did succeed. <laughs> and because of the landing and we brought all those troops from the rear end, uh, we were able to drive the North Koreans further back and get them tied up. So uh, Blob moving on more quickly, he does succeed in pushing them above the 38th parallel line and he keeps pushing them further north. Now this is where it gets contentious uh, because MacArthur wants to uh, control or conquer the whole country of Korea. He wants to unify both the North and South under one nation, a democratic nation, and kick the communists out. Truman is a little leery about that whole idea. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he came in with the idea that this would be a limited war, by the way. In a limited war, first of all, he had decided he was not going to use nuclear weapons. He was not going to develop a, a war in which he would use nuclear weapons. He thought that was too dangerous, plus the Red Chinese. Now, if we show, uh, just to give you some idea <laughs> of the big bull in the closet, there's China, there's Korea, and there's Japan. And China said, don't you go any further up North Korea or we're going to get involved. And the Chinese had the largest land uh, army in the world. Plus, they now had nuclear weapons. Uh, MacArthur really went poo-poo 
to that in terms of his own arrogance and decision making. He was in charge. He actually got to think this was his army and he was going to do what he wanted with it regardless of what the hell the president said or, as we know, the Constitution, which, uh, by the way, if we pointed out, is uh, the commander-in-chief of the military in black letters under the executive department. <laughs> he meets them in uh, Midway Island. Truman decides, I've got to have a face-to-face -face talk. Small island way out in the coast uh, of the Pacific Ocean. Truman flies out there and I'm uh, going to meet MacArthur. And as he's flying the plane, one comment is, I said, uh, well, I'm about to meet the right hand of God. <laughs> and another story said that uh, MacArthur was flying around and decided to come in late. You know, it's always, he saw his plane land and then he took a couple of circles around before he landed so he could come in after Truman alighted. <laughs> Dude, he said, son of a bitch. Anyway, they had a congenial talk. We'll go back. They had a congenial talk. Uh, according to the, the, the books and the items. Uh, but Truman wanted to know, you know, uh, if there's any indication that the Red Chinese are going to get involved, I want to know. Because I do not want to provoke them and I do not want to get in a war and we'll try to negotiate some kind of a peace settlement. MacArthur assured him, uh, basically clearly, no, they're not going to get involved. Don't worry about it. You know, in other words, we'd say it's a piece of cake. Uh, one of the words was, we'll be home by Christmas, <laughs> which is about three or four, I'm sorry, three or four months. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted one of the ideas, because uh, this is a whole different style of fighting than you see in the Pacific. It's more like northern Germany up there, but some of the frozen temperatures, and if you've been in you've, Korea, 30, 40 or more below zero at times in the northern part. And uh, some of the toughest fighting took place as the American troops and South troops kept moving north to the Chosin Reservoir, the large area up in the north part near the uh, Yalu River, which I'm going to mention in a while. But this is the style of fighting. And it was a lot of difficulty because of the frozen uh, temperatures, including clothing, and they weren't sometimes prepared, or the right weapons or things that would freeze up. Uh, it was extremely difficult. And by the way, I do have to say, from what uh, I know, MacArthur did not spend a lot of time in Korea. Uh, about 90% of the time was spent in Japan. He used to fly back and forth <laughs> to where he was in command from the bird seat. But anyway. Uh, is there a picture? Let's go back. Okay, let's go back one more. We just want to go back to the map. Okay. Uh, the, where the, you can see the border of China and Korea right there. That's good. That's good, Arrow. That's called the Yalu River. And we were told, Maca and uh, Truman told MacArthur, do not go beyond the Yalu River. That's China's territory. In fact, it was so strictly limited that our saber jets chasing Russian MiGs. By the way, the Russians are heavily involved also in support of the North Koreans. If you get to the Yellow River, you cannot follow them across the border. And really, in some ways, this is what uh, angered MacArthur. It's like fighting with one hand behind your back. Uh, they could run across the, the, uh, the Yellow River, attack, explode, we chase them, you have to stop and then go back. We couldn't explode things, we couldn't blow things up beyond the Yellow River, whatever it is, according to the rules. And as uh, MacArthur said it on several occasions, there's no substitute for victory. And uh, <laughs> his plan was really eventually, okay, even if Red China does get involved, we'll attack, I want to blow, and I want to nuke several of the major cities on the east coast of China. He had it all planned out to use atomic bombs. Without Truman's approval, this is a you know historical fact. Uh, he actually goes even further when Truman says, "No, we're going to start to negotiate because it was found within a month, three hundred thousand Chinese troops were over the border attacking in North Korea, three hundred thousand, and now they started to push the Americans and the South Koreans further and further down the peninsula. So we had a, like this seesaw thing going." And Truman said, ah, I want to get out of the war. Uh, MacArthur didn't. MacArthur actually sent news uh, reporters information about what his plans are. They publicized it in different newspapers throughout the country and what his plan was. He actually had a representative on the House on the floor uh, decrying the horrible strategy of Truman and that he supported uh, 
MacArthur's views of how to attack China and win the war. On the House floor, there was nothing, if you think about it, that Truman could do but fire him. This is an insubordination in a a la, you can be just, uh, you know, according to the, to the commander in chief in the order. He had pushed him into a corner. Uh, Truman was extremely reluctant because, again, I'll have to say, he is the most popular supported man in America at the time. And the, uh, the, the little haberdashery guy from uh, Missouri is going to fire the most popular, fearsome general in world history. Yeah, so we got that magazine, uh, sorry, newspaper account uh, of the great one at the time that it happened. And I did find this that was published in different newspapers. <laughs> he could never wear MacArthur's hat. <laughs> MacArthur returns to the United States. It's a ticker tape parade down the main city of Manhattan, New York City. He is beloved. And I can't imagine, if I'm thinking I'm Truman, I'm going, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, Truman's polls, after the firing, are the lowest that I've said, ever read, ever occur in American history since polls were taken. And I, the sum that I came up with was as low as 20% approval. Uh, Uh, soon after, just jumping ahead on this one, uh, well, Mac I, I do have to say, MacArthur goes, to, yeah, I wanted to say, MacArthur gives a speech to end, uh, after the ticker tape parade, he goes to Congress and he gives a farewell speech in front of the House, and the, he had that voice, you know, it was called, old soldiers never die. It used to be very dramatic. They just fade away. And now this old soldier is now going to fade away. Thank you. They said the Congress stood up, the applause was immense. People were crying <laughs> when he left. Uh, MacArthur will try to, by the way, run in the Republican primaries because it's always been back of his night he wanted to be the President of the United States. Uh, a few months later, his uh, popularity declines when he started publishing his views and his articles about starting World War III with, with the communist Chinese. That's uh, a little bit too far for me. So he, uh, he didn't really get that far with it. Another accomplishment, I have to say quickly, in 48, uh, uh, the UN was looking for a place for a Jewish homeland. I'm not going to get into a lot of this because this would take another two courses. But uh, it was the UN that decided to give them Palestine, and that's the territory. Uh, and they decided to put them in and create the country of Israel. And the thing I will uh, tell you is that uh, Truman, once they created the state of Israel, he recognized it as the state 10 minutes later as a recognition from the United States, which was an amazing support for that country worldwide. And he did that against a lot of people who advised him not to do that. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, un, uh, you know just not, uh, not popular. And it would hurt him at the polls uh, in terms of elections. And you, I'm sure you can guess why. He also had to deal with the, what we call the Red Scare. I don't know if you recognize that guy on the left. Uh, McCarthy, from the McCarthyism of the McCarthy era. He, he was in the Senate. He's the one that, uh, you know, had all these names of communists that were hiding in the State Department and in the War Department. Uh, he actually lied about most of them. Uh, but he was, people were terrified of him because he ran this thing called the Un-American Activity uh, Committee. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It was a vicious committee where they subpoenaed uh, hundreds and hundreds of people to testify to see if they were communists or not. And they grilled you by the committee. We were so worried about trying to find communists in the government. This guy actually held up a large paper and said, I know the names of 200 communists are on that list. None of them were on the list. He wouldn't show it to anybody, and he lied about every single one of them. But he got national attention. For two years in America, that one guy, you may not know, was the most terrified figure uh, in the United States government. Nobody wanted to touch him. Even Eisenhower came on. Uh, because uh, people had a, such an anti-communist feeling about them. If you really made a, an attack on communists, you were popular and you could get far in the government. 
a la, you know, uh, Dick Nixon. He became a rabid anti-communist fighting the Reds in California. He ended up winning a House seat and Senate uh, from the California based on that kind of uh, anti-commie red smearing, they called it. All you had to do was get called before the committee and you were probably ruined. Hundreds and hundreds of people had their lives ruined because they got called before the committee and your name was put in the paper. You might be a communist. And they would ask you things, did you ever join a socialist party? Socialist, because back then you actually equated a socialist with a communist. If you were a socialist, you're only one step away from being a commie. And that's really bad. So if you were in a socialist party or you attended a meeting or you or knew or a friend of yours was in a communist party, you were smeared and they wanted you to give their names before the House Committee of, on Activities. Who else do you know? And they wanted names. Otherwise, you could be slammed with some kind of uh, untruth or uh, verifying your uh, testimony before the Congress uh, and subpoenaed perjury. And back then, you could actually get penalized for it. But it was undaunting. It was horrible. Uh, finally, en enough people came out against McCarthy. Uh, later, Truman actually wrote two articles that, you know, the Russians and the communists, the, the, the most important asset they have in America is McCarthy. <laughs> and he said that in a press conference uh, about what, uh, what that meant to him. And he called him in a different letter, a scurrilous snake in a pathological liar. Uh, in the front, in front of, uh, in, in the press about him. So for two years, we, uh, we were under this incredible, it was a Korean War, uh, commie, commie, commies all over the place. Uh, this was the time that we had atomic bomb drills, as some of you probably remember. Uh, you know, we had the fearing that the bomb was going to be dropped by our enemies, uh, duck and cover, you remember that? So, you know, go hide underneath the desk and you got a large bomb blowing up to all us brick billions, they hit their shit. And then, you know, one comic says, they wanted me to hide under a desk made of kindling wood. <laughs> I remember, I was actually frightened. I remember like 10 years old, Remember the duck and cover cartoons? This State Department produced it and they had a turtle. Uh, it was the example of duck and cover because he pulled in his head and his arms. <laughs> and they said, if you're riding a bike, and this was an actual documentary produced by the State Department, you go on, you see a red flash in the sky, what should you do? And they said, dive off the bike and hide behind a tree. <laughs> well, you saw the picture of what happened to Hiroshima. <laughs> anyway. I mean, it really was a foolish time, foolish, in terms of our attitude. When, you know, and radiation was gone. People were actually going to the atomic bombs, blasting in Nevada and actually watching them. Ooh, this is fun. They think it's the 4th of July, for Christ. <laughs> uh, uh, anybody recognize a couple up there in the top, right? Yes. Yes, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were the only uh, spies uh, that were convicted and, uh, and executed by the United States government during that period of time, and there were a lot of people that were nominated. Uh, a lot of time, a lot of evidence came out, or not evidence, but their children and others said that they were innocent. There was a big view that the fact that they, uh, they were not spies, uh, but within the last 15 years or so, the, the evidence is pretty concrete that they were spies. And uh, whether you uh, should execute them or not is another story. Of course, it was very controversial at the time to execute uh, a woman. Uh, that was done very, very rarely. But they both worked uh, in dealing with the Manhattan Project, and she was a secretary there, and she actually passed off some of the secrets to Moscow. So uh, they found evidence enough to secure the fact that they were spies in the American government. Okay, so now we get, he's uh, get him into retirement at the end of the war. At the end of his term, uh, by law, I don't think you could run again. If you serve more than two years of a, of a predecessor's term, uh, you can't run for a third term. They passed. I do have to tell you, he did not have a pension. We had no pension for presidents. Uh, and he was, quote, low on funds, as he pointed out. Uh, he didn't write any big books. He didn't make any money off it. He actually, he actually said any politician that gets rich is probably crooked <laughs> in office. Uh, this is a perfect, this is like, uh, I don't know, uh, leave it to beaver type of household, <laughs> right? He's all dressed up. There he is reading him best quietly in a very modest home. Somebody visited, they told me, his house uh, here that was in the room. Somebody here? 
Oh, oh, yeah, they went there. It was a very, it's a very modest house. And they said, Harry, what are you going to do when you retire? And he said, well, I'm going to put the suitcases up in the bedroom, and then I'm going to come down, and then I'm going to take a walk down to a drugstore and have an ice cream soda. <laughs> and that was it. Uh, he did develop uh, uh, the Truman Library. He liked that very much. He spent a lot of parts of his uh, retirement uh, having history le lectures. He loved history. He uh, loved having school children come in for the, an hour or so to his library and he would prepare a, a, a lecture based on that. He did some campaigning for the different um, presidential hopefuls. Uh, he thought Nixon was sneaky and a liar. Oh, God forbid. Uh, JFK, eh, he's a little bit too young and inexperienced, you know, for his, uh, for his blood, for, for what he had to do. Jerry, I thought you said he liked to drive. Yes, he was an avid driver. He loved driving. He bought it. One of his uh, benefits that he finally decided to get was to get a brand new Chrysler car, a big car, and he loved driving. He took different trips. And one of the stories was he ended up going to Washington, D.C., and one of the policemen on the highway at Pennsylvania Anvil gave him a ticket for speeding. <laughs> and when he stopped and he found out, oh, it's the President of the United States. No, you're doing your job. You know, so I'll, just, you know I'll just make it a warning. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's what I loved about him. You know, really, to the day, the, he was born to the day he died, plain, ordinary, just a guy devoted to do his duty. Uh, no scandals except for a few other members of his, uh, his own government. Nothing connected with him uh, that you can find. Either money, love, or any other aspect of, of his life in terms of his devotion and what he did. Just straightforward as a book called Plain Speaking is an autobiography about him. This is amazing. Uh, there's only seven put in the rotunda in the Capitol statues. This was done literally two and a half weeks ago. The statue was completed and it was unveiled. I happened to catch it at the time watching the C-SPAN uh, where the unveiling took place. Um, seven others like Lincoln, Washington, and Jefferson's on there. I can't think of all of them. For some reason, Alexander Hamilton's <laughs> uh, There are just six and he becomes the seventh uh, statue to be put up there. Just as you see down the bottom, if you do enjoy Harry Truman, both I happened because of yeah. this, I, I saw this James Whitmore, it's about an hour and a half play. Yeah. It's on YouTube, it's called Give Him Hell Harry. If you look that up on the internet, and it's it's worth a walk. It's good, very good. It, it just it brings to life the personality, what he was like, as well as a lot of the details that you heard here today. Just one thing on a Whitmore, because you get the rest of it. I, I didn't know this, but uh, he was approached by the Ku Klux Klan in Missouri, which is very strong. You know, it was a slave state way back. And the Klan came to him, who had threatened him on different times, because he often spoke in favor of blacks and other minority groups and, uh, and Jews. And uh, a group came up to him in uh, 1924. He was running, running for a judgeship. And uh, they said, you know, that they were willing to support him. It, so the story goes. And... Uh, Truman literally told the group, I would just die not at the support of you hooded bastards. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what you can do with your support. You can turn around and shove it up your new what, you know what. <laughs> uh, which was a dangerous stance in those days with the Klan. And they, uh, 1924 was very popular. 24 and 25, they have over 5 million signed up members. And a lot more supported them than 5 million. Uh, there was a hundred thousand of them in 1925 marched on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington D.C. to show you the strength of that of that group. Then, Thank okay. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.